everyone, you are watching Conversations with Alanki. Revolutions have happened throughout the history of the world in order to bring a change to the established political order, to bring a change in the system, and this was precisely the purpose of the Aragalia in Sri Lanka. Now, if I'm to talk a little bit about Karl Marx, who was a revolutionary leader, his ideas had a profound impact on world politics. The JVP is a Marxist-Leninist party, Andhra Kumar Lisanayaka, um, established NPP, and their popularity has risen at an exponential level while we head to the elections this year. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I am uh, in conversation with Member of Parliament, Dr. Harini Amrasuri. Welcome. Thank you, Alanki. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Uh, so, Doctor, as we begin this conversation, uh, I just talking about how NPP was founded by the uh, by JVP leader Andhra Kumar Disanayake, and JVP is a leftist political party. So, could you say the same about the NPP? Is the NPP also inspired by the same ideologies? The NPP uh, came into being somewhere in the. 2015, 2016, uh -huh. well, 2015, the conversation right. started, I would say. We formally launched in 2018. We are, I would describe ourselves as a left-oriented, left-wing progressive mm -hmm. party, right? We're not a Marxist-Leninist party like the mm -hmm. JVP because that, 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 require, that is a Marxist-Leninist party has a much more formal structure. There are right. a full-time cadre in that party, for example. We don't have that system. Uh, but we are left wing, right? We are left wing. We are uh, we are progressive, uh, and uh, Marxist philosophy uh, obviously has an uh, has an influence on our ideological thinking. But not not only Marx, right? I mean, there are uh, Marxism is a philosophy that has survived in this uh, world for many uh, many years and has inspired many progressive movements. And we are certainly in influenced by that and we are also influenced by current thinking on Marxism, mm -hmm. on new interpretations of Marx and on critiques of uh, existing, of the existing world order, right? So we're not, in, in short, we're not a Marxist-Leninist mm -hmm. party like the JVP, uh, but we're definitely, I would say, progressive and left-wing. All right, uh, that's that's uh, interesting and um, uh, mm -hmm. let's revisit the Aragalia. So, assuming there was an election soon after the Aragali, and if the NPP had assumed power, what would the NPP have done to uh, provide relief to people? For us, one of the main things was that uh, we were in a state of economic crisis, which uh, really created a, a new class of vulnerable people. And we always felt, and this is something we consistently argued, that the crisis was not, in a way, their fault. The crisis was a political, uh, the, created by a political crisis, by a political failure. And that there should be a network to protect those vulnerable, especially those who are really rapidly losing their income and rapidly losing the, their most basic needs. So one of the things that we would have done was to ensure some kind of safety net for those mm -hmm. had we come into power immediately after the Aragale. But for us, uh, our, our, our entire approach has been one that, yes, you address the crisis, but you also need to address the causes of the crisis, uh -huh. right? And that requires kind of a much more systemic overhaul, right? Not just looking at managing the economy, but looking at the causes of the political failure and mm -hmm. addressing that. And for us, that really means uh, revisiting the contract, the social contract between citizens and the government. Right? We feel that in our, our country, that contract has actually failed. There is no trust between the citizen and the government. Mm -hmm. right? And we really need to look at how we can, we can engage it with, uh, uh, we can come up with a new contract where people feel that they are part of the system, mm -hmm. that they can trust in institutions that are expected to Look out, look out for them, look out for their best interests. And that there's accountability. That there's accountability, mm -hmm. absolutely, right? So for us, that is, that is the real change that needs to happen. All right. Um, and um, 
when I watch the news, uh, I come across many videos mm -hmm. of politicians in mainstream political parties who always point out, I mean, who are very quick to point out that the NPP has no clear understanding of economics mm -hmm. and that they have no clear uh, or credible economic policy. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you respond to this? You know, I think that's a, that's a political attack. Mm -hmm. It's not based on a, on a real understanding of what our policy is or mm -hmm. what we are about, right? Because we can't be attacked on any other ground, this has become kind of like the mantra now. Oh, mm -hmm. they don't get economics. They can't fix the economy. I would like to pose a question back to those critics. What is the economy that they have created for us, right? Where, where are the fixers for the economy that they are proposing, right? I mean, in a way, that is what has got us into a mess. So for uh, we do have an economic policy. We have an economic council that is chaired by Professor Anil Jayanta. He's a, a, a professor of uh, professor from the University of Sri Jayawardenepura, uh, and they have been talking about the economy and what we plan to do consistently. Right. And over many, we've presented our economic policy to different forums. We've got feedback, right? We uh, and we will continue to talk about it. Basically, we have. Do you want me to talk about the basics? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have basically our economic policy is based on three fundamental principles. We believe in economic democracy. Also, economic mm -hmm. democracy means one that is based on uh, expanding the productive sector. That means goods and services also need to be produced. You, mm -hmm. We can't kind of completely be dependent on external sources for goods and services, right? So expanding a production, eco productive economy, ensuring that more people are able to participate in that economy, because currently our economy is very lopsided. It's, mm -hmm. it's created huge inequalities, right? There's a top player that is extremely wealthy and a mass that is not uh, benefiting from the economy at all, right? So we want to widen opportunities so that more people can engage in right. the eco economy, participate in the economy, and also benefit from the economy. And the third, uh, for third factor is, again, how do you ensure that the, uh, the benefits of the economy uh, are accessible to, the, to, to, to more, to everybody, according to how they also participate in the economy, a fairer tax system, a fairer way of ensuring that there's a, a social security net that will uh, protect the vulnerable, protect marginalized people, right? So that that economy that actually works for people, rather than people working to, up, to uphold an economy that doesn't work for them, mm -hmm. right? So it's based on those three fundamentals that our economic policies uh, has been formulated. We've identified particular sectors where we think Sri Lanka has potential in expanding, right? Tourism, the IT sector, agriculture, which is also linked to our food security, right? We see a role, we, we see that the, the, the state and the private sector need to have different forms of collaboration. Certain sectors of the economy can be completely handed over to the private sector. Certain sectors, there needs to be more co collaboration between the state and the public mm -hmm. sector. We are also looking at other models of collaboration where people are more engaged directly in that, in their own economy, like cooperative models, people-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. where there's a private sector, the people, as well as the state, right? So all of these models are uh, things that we've talked about and things that we plan to uh, include in our uh, economic strategy. All right. Uh, something that has, um, over the years, something that I've admired about the JVP and, and the NPP uh, is that they always expose corruption. Um, how it a NPP-led government tackle corruption which transpired in the previous regimes? Yeah, so f the main issue there, Alanki, has always been the lack of political will to tackle corruption. Mm -hmm. Because in our view, corruption is very much a part of the political system, the political culture, Indeed. the existing, right? They cannot survive without corruption. Mm -hmm. That's one of the bases on which this whole system functions, right? right? So for us, it requires a a change of political approach, a political culture, one that is committed to rooting out corruption, right? So we have laws, we currently have laws. We 
everyone got together and passed an anti-corruption bill as well. But it's the implementation that is always the mm -hmm. problem in our country. And why? Because then there's political interference in the implementation. Polit politics gets in the way of uh, how, an, how policies are implemented. So for, for us, the main thing would be change at the top, where there's political will, where the leadership is absolutely committed to a corruption-free governance system. And we think that that is, that is the real change that will ensure that uh, corruption will be tackled. So with regard to past instances, there's a law of the country. There's, there are, there's plenty of evidence of corruption. And we intend to make sure that the institutions that are empowered to implement and invest, investigate and uh, hold those to account will be allowed to function, right? At the moment, there are barriers that don't allow those cases to be investigated. We will remove the barriers. All right. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, a different mm. topic. Um, uh, recently, um, uh, JVP leader Andhra Kumar Dilsanayake visited India, mm. and many were quick to point out that JVP has now changed its anti-India stance. How, yes. how does the NPP respond to this? Yeah, I, I mean, I spoke about this last night as well, and I, I and I said I, I don't agree with the 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 description of either the JVP or or the NPP as anti-India. You can't mm -hmm. be anti a country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's silly, right? Right. Uh, we have been critical of certain policy directions ca countries have taken vis-a-vis -vis us, and we've been also critical about how our own governments have engaged with uh, foreign uh, foreign countries compromising our security and compromising our independence, right? right? So this particular anti-India stance label comes from a very particular moment in history where the Indo-Lanka uh, agreement was imposed on Sri Lanka uh, by two, uh, was an agreement basically between two leaders of a country which was not uh, approved by either country, the mm -hmm. people of either country, which so it was not reflective. It was not reflective. It was anti-democratic. It was not consultative. It didn't take into consideration the uh, view, views of the people. It was an agreement between two countries, which we, uh, well, which the JVP at that time felt compromised our national security. And they were against that. We've also been critical of um, uh, economic dealings, which are not transparent. Mm -hmm and which are not competitive, right? Uh, whatever the country, whether it's India, China, the US, we, you name it, whatever country, we believe in an open, transparent uh, uh, environment where foreign investors can come and uh, be, be uh, transparent about how they invest in our country and by opening up, uh, opening opportunities for the best bidder to come forward and invest in our country. And we've been critical where those, those engagements have not been transparent. It's not nothing to do with a country in particular, but with that particular project, mm -hmm. right? And we've also believed that whatever foreign investment needs to also come in a way that doesn't compromise our strategic interests, so that it happens within some national, within a national plan that we have as a country that we have control over, uh, over the directions in which and our sovereignty and our sovereignty exactly, right? So, or in those instances where we feel that those are compromised, we will always speak out with whatever country it is. And I've also wanted to know your views on um, children pursuing mm. their higher education abroad because um, I, I think you probably get asked this question yes. many times because uh, the JVP has been opposed to certain private universities. Mm. Uh, what, is, what is your policy on private investments in the education sector? It's like this. We think that education is a right. Absolutely. And uh, education needs to, the government has a responsibility to ensure that every child, person actually, because we also believe that education is not limited to a particular age group, mm -hmm. right? There's a concept called lifelong education, that the government has an absolute uh, obligation to ensure that access to education, access to quality education is ensured for all. Right. Right? Uh, can, a, can the private sector be part of education in Sri Lanka? For year, I mean, for centuries, we've had 
private schools, right? Mm. The phenomena of private universities, much more recent. And I and that has happened also kind of in parallel to the to the state withdrawing from education and not being able to provide educational opportunities for all to keep up with the demand for higher education, right? right? Uh, will a NPP government shut down all the private educational institutions? Certainly not, uh -huh. right? Will we regulate them? More certainly, right? Because currently there is no regulation of private uh, educational institutions. But our focus will be on investing in state education, on making sure that state education provides a quality education for all, mm -hmm. right? If someone still wants to, uh, go uh, by choice, go to a private education and institution or go abroad for education, that right will be preserved, right? But the government's responsibility is to ensure that everybody get, has access to public education. Whether right. they take that option up or not is their de decision, but the government responsibility is to ensure that. And to ensure that there is no, right now, Alanki, there's a huge inequality in the kinds of education that people are able to access, whether it's in schools or whether it's in higher education, mm -hmm. right? Those who can afford to get a better quality of education than those who cannot afford. We think that's unfair, mm -hmm. right? Your ability to pay shouldn't determine the quality of the education, of the education you, receive, you receive, right? right? And that ensuring that that is not a factor is the role of the government. That is all that we are going to to do. And you've, uh, Dr. Haini, mm. you have conducted, uh, carried out research and advocated mm. for causes such as gender inequality. Mm. Uh, how, what would the NPP do differently to uh, uphold and strengthen the rights of women? I think we're already doing things differently. <laughs> Certainly. Right? Uh, one of the things is that, well, if we talk about politics specifically, uh, we feel that women are uh, underrepresented in politics, in decision making, right? And that is due to the way in which uh, society is also organized. I think we had a conversation before we started recording about why there, although there, uh, the number of women receiving legal education is so high, you actually have very few women practicing law, right? right. And that is to the, because of the nature of that industry where it is very male dominated where it is perceived as unsafe for women right. but also because of the care work burden that women have to uh, carry right so uh, and this care work is something that is not recognized by society unpaid care work that women engage they engage in is not recognized is not valued is not part of our thinking about how society needs to be organized right things like paternity care child care benefits, right? Maternity leave, uh, child care, daycare centers, elderly care, care for the disabled. All of these things are completely neglected areas in our society and they burden women, right? Indeed. Which then limits the kinds of choices that women have about engaging outside their homes, right? Whether it's jobs, whether it's politi political life, whether it's career, whatever it is. So we intend to change that, right? We intend to make sure that women are not burdened by care work, that women can also make the kinds of choices they want to make without feeling that they are, uh, you know, that without feeling guilty, without being constantly under pressure to kind of balance so many uh, roles that uh, society is imposing on them. All right. And when we talk about women, um, that reminds me recently there was a lot of controversy about a statement, statement being made regarding mm. legalizing prostitution. Mm. Now what happens in our country is that women who engage in sex work are really harassed through the law because they, there is no proper legal framework through which they can be arrested. So very outdated laws are uh, sort of uh, activated mm -hmm. to uh, mainly harass women who are enga engaged in sex work. Not just women, that's the other thing, right? It's not only women who engage in sex work. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem and this has led to a lot of abuse, a lot of uh, harassment for people who are often forced by economic conditions to make those kinds of very difficult choices, right? right? 
So the NPP's position has been that A, we don't want to create, we want to create an economy where no one should be compelled to make those kinds of choices that women and men are often have forced to make in order to simply survive, in mm -hmm. order to send their child to school, in order to feed their children, right? So we want to create an economy where people can make good choices about the kind of work they want to do, right? We also want to make sure that the law is not used to harass those who are engaged, engaged in any kind of work that is socially not acceptable. I mean, there are other ways of dealing with it. Right. Right. But the law can't also be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. The law can't be used selectively to harass people just because they are a sort of marginalized section of the community. Right. That's not a how a civilized society functions. Right. So that's what we were talking about. Right. The um, fact that that was then, misinterpreted. Yes, because it's a it's a it's something that is a trigger for sort of all kinds of anxieties. And, and perhaps be, it's uh, considered to be a taboo topic. It's considered to be a taboo topic. And I think there are many taboo topics that actually we need to talk about. Right. It's actually society, people like you, we can talk about it much more freely. As political parties, when we talk about it, it's always then colored by our politics. And it can trigger unnecessary controversies, right? My personal feeling is that these are topics we need to talk about. We mm -hmm. can't ignore these things because we don't, we, you know, we feel that they are unsuitable topics, right? There, sh there should be social commentators like you who talk about all of these things, who create a dialogue. In some ways, this is, Con this remark that uh, attributed to one of us has triggered a conversation, which I think is a good thing in the long run. Uh, so, Dr. Harney, before we move on to the final question, um, mm. what views does the NPP hold about the IMF? And do you think it's a solution given the current uh, economic situation? It's like this. When the country officially declared itself unable to repay loans, um, it sort of almost automatically sends us on a particular path that is IMF mediated. Our preferred option would have been to not go down that path where we could have managed the economy in a way that we don't declare bankruptcy, where mm -hmm. we don't declare ourselves unable to pay back the loans, right? Because historically, uh, IMF interventions have resulted in uh, the burden of debt and the burden of the economic reform being very disproportionately borne by the poorer sections of the community or the most vulnerable of uh, sections of the community. Lately, the IMF has also changed because there's been such a there's been such pushback on their austerity programs that they've had to take into account the impact of their austerity programs on uh, sections of the community. So they are much more. Uh, sensitive to this issue. Uh, so what we, we met with the IMF recently and what we discussed with them is that if, if we form a government, we will be forming a government with a mandate from the people to renegotiate the conditions of uh, mm -hmm. the current agreement. We want to make sure that the debt restructuring process, that the burden of the debt restructuring process is fairly and proportionately distributed within society, that no section is unduly burdened by mm -hmm. it, right? That's one thing. And the second thing is that as much as we manage the debt, we also need to make sure that the economy grows, right? If, if we continue to take decisions that contract the economy, then repaying our debt is going to become harder and harder. Meeting the obligations of ensuring the welfare of people will become harder and harder, right? So we want to also, while we are managing the debt crisis, also make sure that we are taking decisions that will not contract the economy, that will mm -hmm. allow the economy to grow, that will mean that people can engage in their, in their livelihoods, that they will not lose jobs, right? Uh, that industries will be able to function, right? So. We, we want a holistic approach to the mm -hmm. economy rather than one that just simply looks at managing the debt. And that's a discussion we will have with IMF. Is it possible, though, to negotiate with the IMF or do they expect 
uh, countries to abide by their recommendations? No, the IMF is an organization that will advise a government on how to manage the mm -hmm. debt, right? And they will ap uh, apply conditions to the debt, to the loans that they offer, to the, their, their, right, right? But the ultimate decision has to be made by the... the, the lies the, with the government. Lies with the government, mm -hmm. right? And the IMF also understands, and this is something we discussed extensively with them, that no economic reform is possible without the consensus of the people. And obtaining the consensus, consensus of the people is the responsibility of the government, mm -hmm. right? And this government does not have a mandate to implement what it is implementing. This government does not have the approval of uh, the people to implement what it is implementing. That will be the difference with us. All right, and uh, moving on to the final question, Dr. Harani, like you said, there is no equal representation of women in mm. politics in Sri Lanka. Um, what has your journey in politics been like thus far, and how have you faced mm. all these challenges and criticisms that are thrown at you? Uh, I think I have been fortunate to have really uh, solid support from my colleagues and uh, from my family and friends. That's been the biggest strength, right? And I'm uh, working in a, uh, with, a, uh, with a group of people, with colleagues, who understand what I'm about and who, with whom I share I, uh, sort of a, a philosophy about mm -hmm. how the world should be, right. right? And the place of women in it. So that has been the biggest strength. Right, and the other thing has been my work with women directly. To be very honest, Alanki, in my whole the last three years, the part that I least enjoyed was, was the moments in Parliament, right, which is a really very male-dominated culture. Right, right. I have not been personally attacked, but I've witnessed what my female colleagues go through, and it's you know really unacceptable. And but being in being a member of parliament has enabled me to work directly with people, directly with women, and that has been tremendously rewarding. Right, that has been hugely rewarding. I've seen women because of the work we are doing engage in politics, feel empowered to come out and do things. I've met young people who've said we want to be in politics, young women, right, and that's been hugely rewarding. So despite all the awful stuff. There are rewards also. And like I said, working within a movement mm -hmm. with which my values are aligned, that has been uh, a huge, huge benefit. All right. Thank you so much uh, for this conversation. It was truly a pleasure having, um, have, have, having had this conversation with you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas. Uh, I'm sure our audience would appreciate it. Uh, it is indeed no easy task uh, to be a woman in politics, and I'm uh, really um, encouraged by seeing uh, Dr. Harini, who has actually made a change and who will continue to make a change, I believe. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I will be back with another episode. Until then, stay safe and take care.